Good afternoon. Our next unit we will focus on the self. In a very simple way, we could think about the self as answering the question, who am I? You might have a lot of answers to that question. You might say, I'm a student, I'm a parent, I'm a worker, I'm a citizen, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm tall, I'm short. So we have a lot of answers to this question. But what do sociologists have to tell us about the self, how we understand ourself, how we understand who we are and what we do? There's a bunch of questions that I want you to think about as we work the next couple of weeks and we, focused on, we focus on the self. I want you to answer the question, what is the self? If you can offer a good answer to this question, then you're in good shape. What contextual factors impact the self? How is it created? How does it change? When does it change? What about location? Does it matter whether we're at work or we're with our friends? How do changes in the broader society impact the self? In the old days, we were farmers and there was no television and there was no, not even schools. The family was basically where you worked, where you went to school, your family was everything. Our society has changed in a major way. How has that impacted how we understand ourselves? What about group memberships? How do those impact the self? I just said, when I said who I was, I said I was a father, I was a teacher, a student, a man, a woman. Those are all group memberships. So how do those group memberships impact the self? And the most important questions are, why is it important to study this thing, the self? And what are the consequences of understanding yourself a certain way? Well, let's begin with psychology because many folks study psychology and psychology is a lot more popular than sociology. So many of you might have an answer to these questions coming from psychology. Within psychology, the self is usually, and I'm, I want to emphasize the word usually, discussed as a thing, an essence, like a personality. It belongs to the individual. I have this thing that's called myself. I have a personality. Within psychology, the self or personality is often discussed as a unified thing. There is this sort of unified self or unified personality. Let's challenge this idea. Please note that many psychological theories of the mind, consciousness, and the brain divide the mind, consciousness, and brain into parts. Think about Freud, one of the most important psychologists around. Freud said there was the id, ego, and superego, and these things can be in conflict. The id might want one thing, the superego might want something else. The ego negotiates between the two. But it sounds to me like the psyche is, is in conflict, and it's these parts that might not be working together all the time. What about neurobiologists? Neurobiologists look at the parts of the brain, how they function, what they do, and how they work. But again, there are parts, and maybe one part of our brain is pulling us one way, and another part of our brain is pulling us some somewhere else. Therefore, I want you to understand that sociologists question the unified nature of the self, and sociologists question whether the self is a thing created by the individual. Sociologists question whether the self belongs or is owned by the individual. So let's talk a little bit about sociological social psychology, which is different from psychological social psychology. Specifically, we're going to talk about the symbolic interaction school. This is a school of sociologists, many of whom worked at the University of Chicago, which is one of the best graduate programs in the country, almost for any field, whether we're talking about economics, sociology, or chemistry. The University of Chicago is one of the best schools in the country. Many people aren't aware of that. And there was a whole school of psych sociologists that worked there, and they created the Symbolic Interaction School. One important sociologist is named George Herbert Mead. Mead actually did not believe in publishing. He taught a lot of students, and they thought his ideas were genius. After he died, or maybe when he was very old, I forget which, his students came together, and they published his notes from his class. That's what they did. They said, he had great ideas, let's publish his notes. 
One important idea for Mead is the idea of role taking. The ability to use other people's perspectives and expectations in formulating one's own behavior. The idea that children struggle with role taking shows us that the self develops over time. When children are in the play stage, I want to note that play stage is not guided by a specific set of rules. Children will play games, they will play with a car, they will play with their dolls or a bear, but there's really no specific set of rules. There's no winning, no losing, no out of bounds. They're just playing and there's no rules that are guiding them in a real strict sense. At this point in development, role taking is limited to one person at a time. A child can understand that his mommy or daddy is upset with him or his mommy or daddy thinks he's doing something wrong. A child can understand that his friend is taking his toy away, but it's very, very limited role taking. The next stage is called the game stage. To meaningfully participate in a game like soccer or baseball, it means understanding a specific set of rules. I have a four year old son who just played his first season of soccer and he really didn't understand the game at all. He didn't understand the rules. The coach had to tell him to throw the ball in and to try to score goals. He didn't really understand the rules. So my son is not really in the game stage as a four-year-old. When children get a little bit older, they meaningfully understand the rules of the game. And part of that is increased role-taking. Now a child can understand that their self is part of a team and their self has to take on roles. If you're the goalie, you understand who you are and what you have to do and you understand what the defense does and what they have to do and what the forwards are and what they have to do you understand you can answer the questions who am i and what am i responsible for and children in the game stage have a greater understanding of self and they understand role taking to a, to a greater extent they understand what other people are doing around them and why they're doing it and how the parts fit together the last step for for Mead is when children develop the generalized other. Another way of saying this is society. The child can respond to the demands of society as a whole. The child understands it's not just daddy who doesn't want me to pick my nose. Society at large doesn't think I should pick my nose and then try to touch people or try to touch food. Society at large, that those are, those are larger rules. The child can now understand that it's not just my teacher that doesn't want me to do this. This is a social role rule that many, many teachers want. It's, it's beyond just one situation. Role taking at this point involves the ability to generalize behavior across a variety of situations and audiences. At this point, a child has a much more con um, concrete understanding of self. They know who they are, they know what they're allowed to do, and they are understanding their social role in the broadest sense. Another important sociologist is named Charles Horton Cooley. He wrote the book On Self and Social Organization. Cooley's most important contribution is the idea of the looking glass self. Each to each a looking glass reflects the other that doth pass is something that Cooley wrote. Cooley had three steps in the process of developing a looking glass self. He said it was a reflective process. He said all of us imagine how we appear to others. Others judge our appearance and respond to us. And then we re react to that feedback. For Cooley, the self is very much something created as people interact with each other. All of these sociologists focused on interaction. The last sociologist we're going to talk about today is named Irving Goffman. Goffman was the president of the American Sociological Association at one point. He wrote this book that most sociologist students will read at one point in their major. It's called The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life. Goffman went to a small island and he observed people on a daily basis. He told them that he was studying farming, so they talked to him about farming because they were a bunch of farmers. But he was really studying how they present themselves. And you have a reading from this book to do this week. So let's talk a little bit about Goffman's ideas. Goffman has been credited with the idea of dramaturgy, which means he looks at the self as performance. He looks at, looks at it as a drama, as, as sort of like a stage acting. 
So Goffman uses terms like performers and audience. He looks at the relationship between the performer and the audience with every social situation. I will be the performer, you will be the audience, and then you're the performer, and I'm the audience, and he uses this way to understand social interaction. He points out that many of us are using scripts. Think about it. When you talk to your old friends, are there a, is there a certain set of um, ideas or a certain set of questions that you ask them? Hey, have you talked to so-and-so? Oh, I remember you said that your, your kid was sick. Did your kid get better? You certain certain themes and ideas that are just reoccurring and they're sort of scripting how we talk to each other and what we talk about. He also uses the word props for us to understand that we have, like an actor, we have props all around us. Do we pick up the chair and throw it? Do we sit in the chair? Do we answer the phone? The clothes we wear? Um, all of those things, like an actor putting on a play, we have all of these things around us and they shape how we present ourselves to others. And of course, all actors have a stage or a setting and we can create our setting. One of the most important ideas that Goffman wants to talk about is the definition of the situation. He argues that when two people come together, one person, let's say I'm the performer, I try to define the situation. I try to tell people who I am, what I'm about, what this situation is, and I try to um, sort of frame the props for them. And the other audience member, the other person in the audience that I'm talking to, can accept my definition of the situation, or they can reject it. They can offer their own definition of the situation. They can offer their own definition of who I am, of who they are. And what Goffman really finds fascinating is when two definitions of the situation come in conflict. If I walk in, into a classroom and I say, I am the teacher, and the students say, no, you are not, we have a really fascinating situation. I am presenting to others that I am the teacher and that, that, that definition of the situation is being rejected. And Goffman says there's something important that we could learn here. One of the most important things we could learn for Goffman is the power of the audience. A lot of us give a lot of power to the performer to the person who's presenting something and saying, this is what the situation is, this is who I am. But Goffman says, we should all remember, the audience has the power to reject anything the performer offers. I thought we'd look a little bit at the text that you'll be reading this week. There's a, a, a key quote that I want to go through word by word with you. In analyzing the self, then we are drawn from its possessor, from the person who will profit or lose by it, for he and his body are merely provided the peg on which something of collaborative manufacture will be hung for a time. What Goffman is saying here is that when we analyze the self, it's a collaborative manufacture. We should not focus on the person, the person who gets the self. The person who is labeled the teacher or the husband or the wife or the friend, we should focus on the collaborative manufacture of the self. And the means of producing and maintaining selves do not reside inside the peg. In fact, these means are often bolted down in social establishments. There will be a team of persons who actively on stage in conjunction with available props will constitute the scene from which the performed self will emerge and another team the audience whose interpretive activity will be necessary for its emergence the self is a product of all of these arrangements and in all of its parts the marks of its genesis what he's saying here is that we should focus on the interaction between the person who says hi i am the teacher and that interactive process with the students and see how the self is created, not by the person, but through the interaction.